This is Pivot Perspectives with Chris O'Byrne, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they've learned on their road to success and get exclusive access on how to implement their success into your life and business. Pivot Perspectives is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Chris O'Byrne. All right, Rob, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I like to start out by going back to childhood and looking at any stories or events and anything that happened that kind of led you to, well, becoming who you are today. Any okay. significant events. So there's this book by the Dr. Seuss publishers called Everything About Me. And I had this book when I was seven years old. And the great thing about this book was this was a hardcover book, not a coloring book, a hardcover book where you were allowed to write in it. It would ask you things like, um, how many steps are you from mailbox? How many steps are you from the nearest fire hydrant? And you'd fill in all of these different pages. And on one of these pages, it said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I still remember filling it out with one of those jumbo pencils that's about as thick as your thumb right now. And you etched into it as though you were carving in stone because that's how seven-year-olds write with a pencil and i wrote cowboy and then i erased it and then i wrote astronaut and then i erased it and then i wrote everything man i wanted to be an everything man and I've been just as indecisive my whole life. But lo and behold, I look back at the trajectory, and wouldn't you know it, in one shape or another, I have become an everything man. I've had some great opportunities with different roles and even career pursuits. But it's all pointed in the same general direction. I'm a helper at my core. I'm a teacher at heart. I was discouraged from going into teaching professionally. Son of a math teacher. My dad has taught in public schools for over 50 years now. Even in his retirement, he's still teaching at the local community college. But it was very difficult to raise a family as a teacher. I saw what he went through, and and he said he didn't want that for me. Now, if I pushed, if I said, but dad, all I want to do in life is be a teacher, he absolutely would have 110% been behind me and supported me. But instead, I I moved on to other things. But everything I've ever done, I've found my way back to mentoring, leading, guiding, training, teaching. So I've been an everything man because I've had all sorts of different roles where I've been able to do that. And at the same time, there's one thread that you can see pulls through all of that. I'm a helper. I like that. And you know, I think most of us have a thread. We just don't see it all the time. We're not, we're not as self-aware. That of what that thread is. We're just head down doing what we do. Um, and like you, I would say being a teacher is a big one for me. I actually did teach math for uh, primarily science, physics, and chemistry. But, you know, looking back and, and looking at what I do now, that's still kind of the thread of what I'm doing. So, when you graduated from high school, and I'm always fascinated by the kind of the transition, and it's it's always fascinating to know what it is that people do when they get out of high school because it takes a while usually to get your groove and get to where you're you're to what you're doing. 
uh, even if it's not exactly what you're doing now, to basically to what you're doing. So what was that transition like for you? College was always just a given for me. Like I said, son of a, a math teacher, you went to school to get into a good college. But I had no idea what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do, like so many other college students, school students looking at college. There was one thing that I did know. We were very fortunate to, as a family, travel to Disney World a few times through my uh, middle school and high school years. And just before graduating high school and on our trip to Disney World, I was talking with one of the employees, come to find out they're called, not employees, cast members. Yeah. And asking them about, well, how did you get this job? This is my dream job because it, it really was to, to work at Disney World where it's a, a, a utopian place and everyone there is so, I'm going to use that word, helpful. Pulling that thread again. She told me about their college program where college students could go on an internship to Disney World for a semester for me. I chose my school based on which schools had a relationship with Disney World and their internship, their college program. In fact, the first semester I was eligible. So this would have been uh, what would have been the start of my sophomore year. I applied and was accepted and uh, went on an internship instead of returning for my sophomore year. I loved it so much that after that internship, I, I finished my sophomore year at my current school and I transferred schools. I went to school just outside of Disney World, finished my career uh, or my college at University of Central Florida there in Orlando and worked at Disney World for almost a decade because wow. what I wanted to do. I loved the thought of being part of, of that community. Now, how does that tie into what you're doing now? Because I don't see the path to that. So that makes me even more curious. I didn't either. Uh, so <laughs> the path kind of went like this after about a decade at Disney World, uh, I grew a little bit older, got married, started to raise a family, and it was important for us to be close to family. I have extended family in the Boston area, and they wouldn't all pick up and move to Orlando. I know, the, right? The nerve. <laughs> so instead, my wife and I and our four-month-old newborn moved back to the Boston area. And um, I worked for Tiffany and Company for a short period because after spending so much time at Disney, the company that literally invented the field of customer service, I could land a customer service job just about anywhere. I enjoyed my time at Tiffany, but it was short-lived because um, in order for me to move beyond just the, the retail and into leadership, I would have had to move to their corporate headquarters in New Jersey. And we just did that whole relocation thing. That wasn't feasible. So I started looking for other customer service jobs. And I landed one with the phone company. Six weeks of interviews, batteries of tests, I still remember to this day the call I got from the HR representative. Rob, we want to hire you for the role of customer service representative. I knew it. I knew my Disney background would help me. But please know, Rob, there is a sales quota with this role. Oh. oh. I know. I swallowed hard and took the job anyway. But I had no idea what I was doing. Up to this point, I had the same perception of sales that most people who are not in sales have about sales. Sales is evil. 
Sales yeah. is yucky. Yes. If sales didn't <laughs> screw up somewhere, we wouldn't even need customer service. Or so I thought. So how does a customer service person to their core, an anti-sales person, succeed in a sales role? I was afraid. I did not want to lose this job. I ended up because I had learned about outrunning the bear. Do you know how to outrun a bear? I know if I'm with somebody else, how, well, how that relates. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. I was very fortunate in that I was probably in the 10th class of new hires. And every week they were hiring between five and 10 people. And there were 10 more classes coming behind us. I wanted to keep my job. I didn't have to outrun the bear. I just had to outrun the people beside me. Yes. The people that didn't have 10 years of customer service background. We got no sales training. We got no customer service training. We got systems and product training, and that's it. So I leaned into what I know. If I can at least not lose the customer, if I can give customer service, well, then I think I can at least outperform the people next to me. Mm. In my book, it takes three things to provide what I would consider adequate customer service. This just bare table stakes. You need to ask questions. You need to uncover the root cause issue. And you need to present solutions so that your customer can make an informed decision. It turns out in sales, there are four things that outstanding salespeople need to do. And customer service people simply cannot do it. Those four things, ask questions, uncover the root cause issue, present solutions so that your prospect can make an informed decision. There's just one that outstanding salespeople do with ease that customer service people cannot bring themselves to do. Care to guess? I've been trying to think as you were saying it, what that might be. Close the deal is all I can think of. Yeah, close the deal would be great. But before you can even close, you have to ask for the sale. Uh, and salespeople can do that with ease and customer service people simply cannot bring themselves to do it. And I actually know why, because that was me until one day I had an epiphany. It was me because I wouldn't dare ask you, Chris, to buy something, to pay for something, because I was personalizing it. I can't afford this. Therefore, I presume you can't afford this. Therefore, in an effort to provide you with outstanding customer service, I won't insult you and ask you to pay for this. Then one day I had an epiphany. And that epiphany was really simple. If we've found the solution to their problem, it's actually bad customer service for me to not let them have it. We don't lie, we don't cheat, we don't steal. And a lie by omission is still a lie. If I've found the solution to their problem, but that problem comes with an additional cost, they're happy to pay it because it solves their problem. Or they don't want to pay for it. Either way, as a customer service person, who offers who what I need to do, and then we can move on. I have since gone on to teach other customer service people about sales, and I love when I'm in front of a customer service audience. I'll start with a, a, a quick story. I'll find a friendly before the class begins, and I'll, I'll say to them, I'm going to ask you for your wallet, and you're going to give it to me, even though that sounds ridiculous. 
so then the class starts and I said, all right, well, some, here's some logistics and we're going to take lunch at this time. And, oh, um, Matt, can you, can you give me your wallet, please? And, and he does. And I look at, okay. So we're going to go to lunch at this burger place, but we're not going to invite Matt because Matt can't afford it. And they all pile on. Ah, Rob, you're ridiculous. How can you even, that, what if he has a debit card? Who are you to choose? I'll pay for it. Hey, thank you all. Now that I have your attention, <laughs> I want to talk about what we're here to talk about today. So having overcome that um, uh, bad habit, if you will, myself, I then went on to have an incredibly successful career selling presidents, club trips, prizes, all those great things. But true to my nature, I gravitated towards the leadership roles and the training and development roles. And, and that's where I, I transitioned from customer service at Disney to while it's sales roles that I'm training and coaching, to me, it's still customer service. And I'm happy to report that the sales industry is coming around to that too. No longer is it effective to be that type A, sell ice to, well, yes. somebody that doesn't need ice kind of mentality. <laughs> it's now, I live to serve. It's that servant sales leader role that I really embrace. Yeah, the, it was... I love hearing that, and I love the way that you present that with the wallet. That's a, a really smart way to do it, because I was always told, you know, it's it's your moral obligation. If you have the somebody solution, you don't decide for them. You're not going to make other decisions for them. You're morally obligated to tell them about your solution, because that's why you have the solution, is to help people. So That's exactly uh, I it. like that. Yeah. So transitioned into sales. Now, how about to where you're at now with Flywheel Results? Have you been doing that? And how did that come about from all of this? So Flywheel Results uh, started because of the pandemic. Uh, the long and the short of it. Uh, I eventually, after uh, about a decade with the phone company, I left uh, to go into teaching. I had a stint in public education. I was teaching math and business in the public schools, and I loved it. Uh, my dad was right. It was difficult to raise a family you know, as a, a teacher, but we managed. And I saw myself riding off into the sunset as a teacher. Um the summer of my second year in public schools, I was looking at my LinkedIn account and thought, I should close this. Teachers don't use LinkedIn. And it was a good get around to it. A week later, a recruiter reached out to me. She said, um, I'm working with this VP at a tech startup. He said, go find me a math teacher. His sales guys don't know how to do math. I thought, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But being uh, with a tech startup was one of my three career bucket list goals at that point. Uh, right. My three career bucket list goals were I wanted to teach in public schools. I was doing that. I wanted to work at a tech startup. Hollywood made it look so glamorous. How often does your bucket list call you up and say, we want you? Yes. So I took that interview. I got the job and I fell in love with the world of startups. The great part about startups is there's nothing but greenfield ahead. Of you. you never hear. That's not how we do things because mm -hmm. they don't have 20, 30, 70 years of institutional operations. They're still figuring it out. They brought me in and said, uh, we just got a bunch of money from our investors. We've been told to pour this gasoline onto the fire that is sales. We need to get from point A to point Z. Not only do we not have the roads built, 
we don't even know what the roadmap looks like. Help us. Did that accomplish some amazing things? Got them uh, some incredible results. Got them through that hypergrowth phase when they turned to me and said, thanks. What do we need you for? Second startup, same story, same results, even faster, same ending. Third startup, same story, same results, not the same ending. I was kept around because they valued what I was able to offer on a continued basis. I was ever so grateful for that until the pandemic came and they had to lay off 90% of their staff. Ouch. Yeah. And that's when I realized, you know, I could try this again, but three strikes and you're out. Instead of doing this within organizations and having a new job every 18 to 36 months, why don't I do this with organizations and just have one job the rest of my life? And that's what I'm doing with Flywheel Results between helping uh, startups through hypergrowth or intensive training sessions, uh, uh, sales, sales playbooks, sales enablement. My favorite one right now is social enablement. I love teaching organizations about social enablement. Uh, that's what I will results has enabled me to do. So before we jump into, I, I want to know more about what you mean by social enablement. What is, is starting your own startup? Was that the third item on the bucket list? Ah, I'm glad you came back to that. Actually, it was working for a major consulting firm. Only to find ah. out that these major consulting organizations, generally it means flying out on a Sunday night and flying home on a Friday night having about a day and a half with my family. And that mm -hmm. was not conducive to the lifestyle that I wanted. So I actually crossed that one off the bucket list to effectively have that with my own startup because I'm consultant. I'm just not doing it for one of the big names. I'm doing it for myself. For yourself. So do you travel a lot? I, I'm very fortunate that uh, I do not have to. And I say fortunate because I know business travel is very different from personal travel. Oh yeah. 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 I, uh, I like to travel a little bit, but not a lot. So right. yeah, not, at least not for business. So social enablement, what is your definition of that and how does somebody leverage it? Sure. Well, if I called it social selling, which is what many people in the industry are talking about these days. It yep. would sound very much that Carly Rae Jepsen song. Hey, we just connected and this is crazy, but here's my sales pitch. So buy some maybe. And ain't <laughs> nobody going to buy your stuff. So I don't want to call it a social selling methodology it's social enablement because it's not about that hard sell it's about being approachable being sociable and being generous and when you are those three things when you are approachable and sociable and generous it turns out people like doing business with people that they like. And the clients that we have end up getting deals 30% larger, 40% faster. Ever once did they pitch their stuff. And that's actually the book that I have coming out very soon. It's called Stop Pitching, Start Selling, The Social Enablement Blueprint. Oh, and nice within title. That, Thank you. Within that, it tells you exactly what I mean by what's it mean to be approachable? What's it mean to be sociable? What's it mean to be generous? 
And how do I leverage that towards commercial results? Because frankly, it is about commercial results, but it's not me giving you that pitch slap. It's about <laughs> me understanding you and what you offer and who you are looking to do business with. And it's about me leaving you with the idea of what I offer and who I can help in terms of business. I've got um, students I teach. I'm an adjunct at Northeastern University teaching an intro to marketing class. So still keeping my hands in that, that teaching pie as it were. And I love to tell them about success in life. Success in life is not about what you know. Now, I'm teaching students at Northeastern University, a highly selective school. Everything they've done to get to this point was all about what they know, what tests they passed, what classes they took, what APs, what SAT scores. It was all about what you know. And here I am telling them success has nothing to do with what you know. Well, not nothing to do but it's not solely dictated by what you know. And then they go, oh, so it's about nepotism. No, fortunately, success in life is also not just about who you know, because you could know everybody, but if you know nothing, if you're somebody worth knowing, mm. success in life is about who knows you for what you know. So your job is to make sure more and more people know you for what you know. That's what social enablement does. It allows you, it enables you to be social, to be sociable, to make sure that in the Rolodex of life, everybody has a good doctor, a sharp lawyer, and if you're lucky, a trustworthy mechanic. Mm. Who is in this for what I want to be known for? I want to make sure that's me. And who is in my Rolodex for what you want to be known for? You want to make sure that's you. That's where being sociable comes in. And then... I don't pitch you anything. You have no need for social enablement solutions, but three conversations later, you're going to be talking with somebody and you're going to go, you know, I was just talking with somebody about how much we hate the pitch slap and he's got a solution for it. And you're going to facilitate that introduction because you're going to remember me. And that's what it means to be socially enabled to be social and to use that to leverage commercial intent down the road. I love that. I've seen that work in my own life when I, when I have fulfilled that role or that, you know, again, be a nice person, be generous, yeah. be social, just be a nice person. And That's really it. it, it, it which, well, as we know, is hard for some people and easier yeah. for others. But <laughs> yeah, we, it, it is. I, I, it but, can uh, be learned. You know, and here's the thing: we all kind of know it, and you know, we hear about karma and good karma. And what I'm doing is not so groundbreaking, because Dale Carnegie wrote the book on it 85 years ago: How to Win Friends yeah. and Influence People. Now, in today's lens we look at that book title as somewhat uh, manipulative, or some do it. But it, it wasn't meant that way when it was written. And I don't mean anything about manipulation when I'm talking about social enablement. What I am doing is putting formal methods into place for those that would say, yeah, I would love to do that, but I don't know how to start. Here's the blueprint on how to do that. And if you're consistent and you do that day in and day out and more people know you for what you want to be known for, that generosity will come back 
and, and pay uh, tremendous dividends. That sociable will come back and pay tremendous dividends. That being approachable is the difference between getting that referral and not getting that referral. It's really just be nice. And we all know how to do that. But what's the, the process for be nice on today's social platforms? That's what we help you. I'm assuming that's a big part of what Flywheel Results does. Can you give me the encapsulated version of, of what you provide? Sure. So we offer consulting, training, and coaching for sales organizations. What I like to say is if you are a VC, a founder, or a sales leader who is looking to improve your sales results, not incrementally, but exponentially, I want to have a conversation. Okay, that's a good encapsulation. I like that because that tells me, that tells me what you do. It doesn't tell me exactly all the specifics because you, you, you can't, but you need right. people to say, Oh, okay. I know what they do. I know it's that, that is well defined. So then along the way, I'm sure that you had many people who influenced you. They were mentors or teachers that you had. Who were some of those people that helped guide you? When it comes to teaching, my biggest mentor and guide was my father. When it comes to um, customer service, I've had so many great people and leaders that have guided me along the way. When it comes to sales, I've had just as many examples of who I don't want to follow as those of who I do. But it, it really, when it comes to sales, it was those customer service first type of leaders or even just customer service leaders that have helped guide way. You need people to give you a break. I'm very fortunate in the, um, the VP of sales that needed to hire that math guy. He gave me a break. I, yes, I had experience in more than just teaching people math. I had done sales training for the phone company for a while, but I was kind of a, a, an odd fit in that I had no previous experience with tech startups. And typically when you're hiring, you want somebody that's done it before. He gave me that chance. And I'm ever so grateful that he did. And I believe he's grateful as well because we were able to accomplish some significant things that prior to having me in place, they were struggling. When I came on board, for example, they had been in this exponential growth mode for about a year. And they were dealing with about 60% turnover in their sales force. 60% turnover means that the salesperson you hire in January, you're hiring for that same seat again in June. That's not exponential growth. That's not even growth at all. And uh, I'd like to remind him, empty seats don't fill quota. By putting the processes in place, by putting the, the frameworks there to build upon, we were able to go from 60% turnover to less than 10%, closer to 5%. We were able to get the sales team from 10 to 50. And we were able to increase the number of people at quota, increasing the quota itself to near double where we started. Was that all my doing? No. I would love to take a victory lap for that, but that was that the right people were in the right place and they were willing to listen and work with me and contribute to the process. So lots of 
influences, both good and bad, but one in particular that I can think to that I'm, I'm grateful for giving me that chance. I like that. You, a question I forgot to ask you earlier, what was it that you did at Disney? Ah, <laughs> some say I was goofy. Some say I still am. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I started working in the American Adventure in Epcot Center's World Showcase. And eventually I worked the attractions in the World Showcase area. So I was working with the international students for a number of years and loved that. What an incredible experience for a college age guy. Then I moved on to uh, their central reservations office. So I had some call center experience. And then I uh, went back to the parks. I was working guest relations on Main Street USA. And uh, my last role there, I was in their guest communications office. So people would send a letter. This is back in the day where email was just becoming a thing. Most people were mailing letters. And if you mailed a letter to Disney World, you got a written response. And that's what my job was, is to, to uh, help compose written responses to all of that correspondence. How fun. It was. It was incredibly fun. Now, had a nice long run, and you've been an everything man, and you've learned a lot. What are one or two of the most valuable lessons that you've learned? I have learned that um, even if you think you're an introvert, get over it. Find your voice because uh, you can know everything. But if nobody knows what you know, do you really know anything? I have learned that um, sharing that voice isn't as hard as it might seem. And they can't eat you. <laughs> you can say things that people don't agree with, and they won't agree, and that's okay. Um, but if you're not saying anything for fear of what others think, then you've already let them beat you down. Still a, a professed introvert. Uh, actually, I think the term now is ambivert. I am outgoing uh, when I have to be. But yeah. I will go and find my downtime, my quiet time, uh, because it, it is hard for me to gather up the energy sometimes to just be social. But it's too important not to. How does somebody go about finding their voice? Great question. I wish I could tell you. I, I will tell you what motivated me. I was hired on my internship for Walt Disney World and placed at the American Adventure. My dream job. And they said on day two, okay. Here's this spiel that you have to give to this audience. What? Yes, <laughs> I rise this page of text and deliver it to an audience of literally 1,000 people every hour. Oh, my goodness. I know. <laughs> I found my voice because my desire to be part of Disney exceeded my fear of public speaking. And it's ironic that it was only one year from the time that I graduated high school to the time that I was doing this at Disney and, and one year of college in between. About that same time, my sister, who was uh, two years younger than me, she wrote a college essay. My sister wrote a college essay about me and how impressed she was that I could get up in front of this audience and speak to them because she still knows me as the guy who's too shy to call and order the domino. <laughs> and she's right. <laughs> That's pretty shy. <laughs> yeah. So how can uh, others find their voice? Put yourself out there. Try it. Find different ways. Uh, I'm happy to help. Contact me. We'll together. Put your voice out there in various find a way. shapes and forms. But you've just got to find a way. 
and with that, you'll find your audience. That's great. And I agree with that. It's, it's like, you know, people who do podcasts, they say that in the beginning, it was awkward trying to figure it out. And then at some point, they can usually point to it and say, right about there is where I found my groove. That's where I found my voice. I've heard that so many times from people who have talked about their podcasting journey. So wrapping things up, what are some of them you have for us? Wow. I don't know that I have any, honestly, because I don't want to deter you from finding your own wisdom. You already know what is important to you. You already know what you want to be doing. You already know how to go about doing it. Maybe you've forgotten because as we said earlier, Chris, you know, that, that self-awareness and we're so head down. I would encourage people to take the time and the new year is a great time for doing it. But I would encourage people to take the time and re-examine their why. This video start with why is one that I show each and every class that I'm teaching within the first 30 minutes of class, whether it's in a formal classroom, or a corporate environment or whatever. And then I'll ask people after the video to examine why they're here. I would encourage anyone to regularly examine their why. Why am I doing this? And I even go so far as to um, talk about the five whys. When you get to why am I doing this and you answer why, then ask again, well, why is that the case? And why is uh, that the case? And by about the fifth why, you will hear something along the lines of, because that's the way we've always done it. And that's where your starting point is. Because your next question becomes, well, why have we always done it this way? And what else? So those no. are not my words of wisdom. Yeah. Those are yours. Not you, Chris, but the, the listeners. Their the wisdom, they have that wisdom when they sit down and listen to themselves. Well, now I know you're a wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> and goofy. <laughs> yes. And goofy. I love it. Rob, thank you so much. This was just delightful. I really appreciated it. Chris, it's been a blast. Thank you. Thank you. There's my record button. That was great. Oh, I, I want really to find out a little it. bit more Thank about you. your book. So uh, who's doing your book? Who are you publishing through? And, and when do you think it'll come out? <laughs> it was due last Friday. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, um, But I'm self-publishing. Uh, I get on my own awesome. through Amazon because uh, it's not going to be a New York Times bestseller. It's going to be a calling card. And, um, yeah. you know, it is exactly as uh, I alluded to. It, it is the step by step, the things that we teach in our social enablement classes, just in, in the written form. But it will introduce people to the concept. And then when they do read the book and a few of them raise their hand and say, I need more than just doing it on my own. Yes. That's when they'll reach out to me and, and we'll work together and get them through it. Did you get a good designer? Uh, chat GPT. Oh. <laughs> it's actually going to be a variation on this background that I have here. Oh, okay. So this is, uh, this, this alludes to the generous part. Since we've done 15,000 books over the last 17 years, if you want help with any piece of it from design to ebook design to, to whatever, just let me know. I would love to do that at no cost just to help you out. I appreciate just, that. I'll, yeah. I'll you up on that. I'll, I, here's, I'm torn. 
I want it to be perfect. But I also just want it to be done. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it, like I say, it's never going to be that New York Times bestseller, but it is going to represent me. So it, it's at least got to be good. So are you designing it yourself, like the print interior and all of that? I've used a software platform called Atticus. Which uh, is, yeah. Uh, simple enough for me. Uh, my neighbor, he over the summer, um, he was a fiction, just happened to have oh. it sitting nearby. And oh, nice. uh, I was asking him about it, and he said, this is what I use. I said, All right, I'll try that. Um, I've heard good say, things, and they're, you know, Dave Chesson does such a great job with all his companies and his work. Uh, just I have a lot of respect for, for him. So I'm sure it's going to do a great job. But, yeah. Any little piece along the way, you just let me know. I appreciate that. I, I really do. Yeah. And um, I know the um, person that I had facilitated that intro, he, he kind of gave you the brush off, which I was surprised at, frankly, because I asked him if he wanted an introduction. Yeah, maybe he was just being polite to me and, and really didn't want the introduction. And maybe he was sincere. Maybe he really does just need a little time to the end of the year to to move forward that's how yeah. I, I foresee this continuing uh there are a lot of people that will get to that social enablement and and they'll become that lowercase i influencer and when it's time to make them that capital i influencer i know just the guy that can help them with that there you go <laughs> i love it yeah this is great okay good well i'm looking forward to uh maintaining a nice relationship this is you're, you're you're my kind of people so i appreciate it likewise thank you yeah well, it's great awesome. to see you again you got it we'll talk to you real soon thanks for listening to pivot perspectives with your host chris o'burn please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advice on the planet follow us on social media for updates and we will see you on the next episode